Hey, I'm Bill Fowler, one of the teaching pastors here at CBC, and we're thankful that you have chosen to uh, stream or download uh, this sermon from one of our series that we preach through on Sunday morning. just want to encourage you that uh, this is never meant to be a replacement for you being involved and being a part of a local church where the Word of God is preached, where you can be known and use your gifts uh, to serve others, how God has wired you. And so uh, as, as this can be a supplemental thing for you to encourage you throughout the week, we'd really encourage you to find a local group of followers of Jesus and get plugged in with them uh, and, and, and see how God will grow you there. So thanks again for, for watching. Again, glad you guys are here. Um, some good singing. I love singing these Christmas girls. Words, even little words, uh, have huge implications right? Uh, small words, prepositions. You know, let me give you a word that, that makes all the difference in the world. The little word with, right? With. And so uh, that word with or without, huge significance. So if you have tea with sugar, that is good. You have tea without sugar, that is brown water. Okay, so huge significance. Some of you went and got coffee this morning, and you drank it the way God intended. Coffee, black, without. Some of you, your weak sauce, you might as well just drink a Coke. Um, you put, you know, six inches of, of cream in there and a little bit of coffee, right? With or without makes all the difference, right? An offense with receivers, All the difference, right? Um, here's one that divided us this week in our pastor's meeting. There's two types of people in this world, I'm convinced, right? Those who eat God's chicken sandwich with pickles and the way it was intended, without pickles, right? Makes all the difference. <clears throat> For those people who are married, have children, a date night with kids is not a date night. Without kids, right? That, that little word, <clears throat> with, makes all the difference, doesn't it? Or without. We have uh, been in a series for Advent. Uh, we called it Emmanuel. Emmanuel is, is the name, one of the names of, of Jesus, of given to him. And it just simply means God with us. Emmanuel. L is the word, Hebrew word for God. Im is the Hebrew word for with, and then in the middle part is that pronoun for us. Nine words, nine letters in the English language. It's huge significance. And so last week, and what we've been, our goal is to, is to kind of over these next four weeks as we kind of think about Advent. Advent just means arrival or coming. We look back at the first arrival and expectation of the second, the second coming. And we just want to talk about and think about for a season what difference does it make that God is with us? Emmanuel. How does that last week bring us hope? Where do we put our hope in? And Clint did a good job unpacking. Hope is not wishful thinking. Some of you yesterday morning, you woke up with hope. It was a false hope because you thought maybe, just maybe, we're going to, it's going to be warm today. What did you think I was going to say? Something about Georgia? I wouldn't do that to you. I would never, I would never mock the Bulldogs on a day like today. Because I know you have no joy, peace, or love this morning. You had hope. It was a false hope. It was a wish. Right? But, but what we talk, when we talk about Emmanuel and the hope that Jesus brings, that's different. It's a confident expectation. Today, we want to talk about how does God with us, <clears throat> how does that bring peace? Or does it? What does that look like? Because that word with, huge significance. With, if God is not with us, there's no peace. But God with us, brings peace. And so we're going to kind of unpack that idea a little bit today. And we don't have one text, so we're going to be moving a little bit, which is a little unusual for me, uh, a little bit harder for me to kind of get my arms around. But, but that's because the, the scripture is, is so full of this idea of peace. Well over 300 mentions of the word peace in the scripture. And, and I think <clears throat> before we jump into what this looks like, it's important for us to define it a little bit. Because 
Peace for us, actually, I don't think we completely understand it or get it often, because we see peace as a negative. Peace is, for us, the absence of stuff, of trouble, of, of war. The absence of children brings peace in the house. Right, so it's a negative aspect, but biblical peace is actually positive. There's an, there is that subset of the no war, no this, but it's, it's a positive in that it's harmony or tranquility or even prosperity. It's not just some psychological state. It's actually a, a God's best good. And so in the Middle East, when you say something like peace to you, it's not saying, I hope you get a nap today or peace. What up, dude? Right? It's a... We want the best for you, the best possible thing for you. That's the idea, right? So that's peace. That's a, a positive thing. And it's also, here's another confusion we have. Peace is not linked to circumstances. Now, for us, it is. Again, no kids. Kids are gone. Kids are at school. Peace. But biblical peace is not linked to circumstances. It's despite circumstances. And this type of peace Harmony, tranquility only comes from one place. We read it earlier, from the Prince of Peace. It's from, it's from Messiah Jesus. And so we're going to talk about how that looks today, because this is what was prophesied, right? So <clears throat> a couple times in the birth narratives of Jesus, kind of the prequel to the birth narrative, Zechariah, you remember this story? He's a priest. He's in offering incense uh, in the temple. An angel shows up and says, your name is, uh, I, I mean, my name is Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. You're going to have a kid. And you're an old man, and your wife is an old lady, but she's going to have a kid too. He's like, no way, Jose. And he's like, yes way, Jose, and you're not going to talk for nine months, bada bing. And so he shuts up. He's mute for nine months. And so nine months later, a little baby shows up, just like the angel said, and everyone's like, yay, what are we going to call him? Let's call him Zachariah, like his dad, because that's what you did. And, and mama says, no, his name's John. And they're like, you crazy lady, ain't nobody in your family named John. And so they go, Daddy, what do you want to name him? And he can't speak, so he says, give me the iPad. He points to the iPad, and he writes out, his name is John. And his mouth opens, and he prophesies about his son, John the Baptist, and then about Messiah. He says this about John the Baptist. You, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. You will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. And this is what he says about Messiah whereby the sunrise shall visit us as a metaphor for Jesus from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. God with us guides us in the way of peace. This is what the angels said, right, when they show up too. You know, kind of post-manger, post-swaddling clothes lying in a manger, right? This is the Charlie Brown, this is Linus, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign. You're going to find him there. And look at the end. We just sang it. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Messiah, God with us, brings peace. Right? Peace. And so what we want to talk about is how. How does Jesus being with us Give us peace. There's three areas we're gonna hit, and the most important one is the first, because if you don't grasp the first, let me just tell you, the other two don't matter, all right? The other two come from the first. So the first one is significant, and it's linked back to what the angel says here. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? Y'all are weak sauce, okay? Y'all slept in late, and you should be a little bit more awake. So unto you is born this day a a what? Savior. Savior. Okay, that's significant, Because if you need a savior, what does that mean? Brilliant. You need to be saved. Saved from what is the question. Saved from what? See, if if our greatest need was the government to get fixed, which some of you think so, apparently, according to Facebook, but whatever. If if our biggest need was a, a, a better government, then God would have sent a politician. If our biggest need was education or new ideas, or new direction, God could have sent a philosopher. If our greatest need was for us to be physically healed and all be healthy and have healthy lifestyles, God would have sent a doctor. If we needed organization, he would have sent an administrator. God would have dwelt among us for that reason. 
right? If we needed new ideas or new religion or we weren't religious enough, God could have dwelled among us to give us a religious leader. None of those are why he came. It says he came to be a savior because we were in danger. Here's the, here's the big question we got to answer. From what? Danger from what? What do we need to be saved from? We need to be saved, okay, get this now, we need to be saved from God. We needed to be saved from God. Say, so what do I mean? Your sins, according to Isaiah, made a separation between you and God. And the peace that Jesus brings, the first and most important peace that he brings that you have to grasp is peace with God. Peace with God. Because you and I were objects of his wrath. You were enemies. You were alienated. Right? Here's what Romans 5 says. If while we were enemies, stop right there. Think about that term, enemy. Kind of a fun word, enemy, 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 right? But think about what is an enemy? Someone who is antagonistic towards you. Someone who tries to hurt you. Someone who is against you. Someone who hates you, right? We would say maybe someone who is evil, right? So if, if it's Nazi Germany, evil, Dallas Cowboys, evil, right? Whatever. But here, here, take, take it down to the personal level. Have you ever had an enemy? I know you're from the South and you, you pretend you're like everybody, but you've had an enemy, right? The neighbor who cut their lawn way too early, didn't whatever, they, they yelled at you, they yelled at your kids, your boss who's been trying to get rid of you, but he can't. Uh, a relative that did something that hurt you, someone who talked behind your back. Maybe you're going back to like fourth grade and Mrs. Mrs. McGillicuddy's class and there was this big bully and then you got picked on for no reason. Someone who left you, someone who divorced you, someone who hurt you, whatever. And there's that, that tension when you think about them, even some of you now. You're like, yeah, I know who my enemy is. I want you to go there because I want you to recognize that was you with God. All that envy, all that strife, all that opposition. But here, here's the difference between us and God. We think about ways we can get our enemy. We can destroy him. God thinks about ways in which he can make peace with his. And I, and I know in our world there's this kind of mentality that, that we just hear this all the time. God is love, and God can just, you know, God is love, and that's, God is love. God is also holy. And in his holiness, God has to deal with sin. Understand, God cannot overlook as much love as he has. He cannot overlook sin. If he overlooks sin, he is no longer holy. He is no longer just. He has to deal with sin because of his holiness. So how does he do that? He says, I, the only way to make peace with my enemies is if I send my son to become one of them and dwell among them and then live the life that you couldn't live and then willingly offers himself on a cross for your sins as your substitute, paying your penalty. And we looked at, we looked at this in Colossians. Colossians 1. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. There's your God with us, right? And through him to reconcile to himself, he's reconciling back to himself all things, whether on earth and heaven, making peace. How? By the blood of his cross. The only way for there to be peace, someone had to pay the penalty, and Jesus willingly, amazingly, not with any reluctance or hesitancy, delights to die for you. And God the Father delights to press this grace into our hands for his enemy. You say, why would God do that? Because his, his favor rests, is what the angel says. Peace on earth among men whom God's favor and his mercy, right? And so we have peace with God. We have peace with God. And you think, what does that look like? I, I know for some of us, we think peace. Yeah, we have peace with God. And it's kind of like our peace with like Russia and America, which is kind of like, yeah, we're at peace, but we really don't like each other. So we'll fly our planes really close and just try to agitate each other. 
and, and kind of get each other mad. That's what we think about when we think of peace. That's not the peace here. The peace of God, peace with God, is that God the Father delights in you like he delights in the Son. That God the Father loves you today like he loves Jesus Christ. You who were his enemy. That is peace. That's the peace that only comes Emmanuel, God with us. That's why it's called good news. And and here's the question, and then we'll move on to the next one. But you got to answer this for yourself. Do you right now, you individually sitting here, whether you're in sixth grade or whether you're in 76 or 86, do you have the peace of God? Do you have peace with God? Only you can answer that, right? You say, oh, I don't know. How do I know? Romans 5 says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace. Here's the question. Do you have faith? Have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and there it is in the verse, for the forgiveness of your sins, that he, that you were an enemy, recognize your sin, your separation from God, that you could do nothing to get to God, that Jesus did it all? Have you put your faith in him, not about him, in him? Have you turned from your sin and put your faith in the finished work of the gospel? That's, that's the eternal question that you have to answer. I didn't ask if you went to church. I didn't ask if you like Christmas carols. I didn't ask if you believed in Santa. I didn't ask you anything. All I asked is you believe in Christ. That's the only way to have peace with God. And if you, you got, you're like, I don't know. I don't you know, I need more explanation. Talk to me. Talk, grab a guy with a, or a gal with a name tag. Go in the back hall afterwards and, and there's some folks that would love to pray with you or whatever. But that, that is the, the most important question you can ask. Do I have peace with God? Have I been justified by faith? That's where it starts. That's the kind of objective application here. But there's two subjective. So we have peace with God. Why? Because God dwelled among us, that God is with us. But we also can have peace in life. And this is where we get confused a little bit, I think. All right? I'm not a water bottle and a sermon guy, but that's helpful. Thank you. Peace in life. We think peace in life means easy life, right? That's what we think. Peace on earth, right? Peace in my house. Kids are outside. But, but the peace that Jesus brings in life is not always what we think. That doesn't mean easy. And you can just read the biblical narratives of Jesus' birth to see it immediately brings chaos to everyone's life that Jesus shows up in. Does Jesus being dwelling among us, does it make Mary's life easier or harder? Single, teenage, pregnant. How does that look? In a culture that's super, super moralistic. Yeah, that didn't make her life easy. Did it make Joseph's life easy? Right? He's got to marry her. He thinks she's been unfaithful. And then when he realizes finally that angel, they have to run away for their lives because Herod is trying to kill them. Easy or hard? No. See, Jesus doesn't make their life easy. Right? He doesn't make it easy. Um, and in fact, he says things like this. Now, this is one of those verses that if you're not familiar with the Bible, you're like, Jesus said that? Jesus said that. Here's what the Prince of Peace says. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth, peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. These are the words of Jesus. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. See, now you understand there's biblical precedence for in-law issues, parents with teenagers. Here it is. Right? Well, what's he saying? He says, I, I, I've come to bring a sword. But then later in John, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace. Well, which is it, Jesus? A peace or a sword? Is there a contradiction in Scripture? Because some are going to say, see, Jesus contradicts himself. Right? You got to understand what he is saying here. Right? He and, and John, I mean, in Matthew says, I didn't come to bring it. But in John says, I did come to leave it. And I think that's significant. Right? Because if you jump down... In this section in John, it's the high priestly prayer, and this last, kind of last night with the disciples, he's got all these things he's teaching the disciples, and at the end, he says, I said these things to you, that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you're going to have trouble, right? So that, that's rooted back to the Matthew passage. Again, 
Jesus, what he's saying there is, look, there's going to be some of you, because of your faith, it's going to divide your family, especially if in an early Jewish family. You're going to turn from the law and go follow this Messiah. It's going to break up a family. Some of you have experienced this. You've, you've put your faith in Christ and your family has rejected you. That's the idea. But his point is, I give you peace, but it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But I've overcome, so take courage. Right? He says, my peace, go, if you go back again to the beginning, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. He says, my peace is different. What does the world's peace look like? Police officers, insurance, health insurance, life insurance, car insurance, anti-lock brakes, airbags, uh, life lock, NyQuil for nighttime peace, uh, all sorts of peace, right? Bank accounts, savings accounts, these things, contracts, these springs, these are peace. And there's nothing wrong with those things. He said, but my peace is different because those are all circumstantial. Whether you have money in your savings or not, that brings either peace or not. He said, that, that's not the peace I'm talking about. Good health insurance, no health insurance. Good health, bad health. That's not the peace we're talking about. He says, my peace is different. This is the same peace that Jesus has. Remember, he is hours away from the cross and he is tranquil. He has harmony. He's at peace with the Father. He says, that's the peace I'm inviting you into here. Paul calls it the peace that surpasses all comprehension. It says, it's a peace you can't get it. You don't understand it. You can't grasp it. It's just from God. And it's supernatural. He says, I am offering that to you. So I, I want you to kind of come into this peace that I have with the Father, that I have with the Spirit. I'm inviting you in because I have, you have peace with God now. You can have my peace. And so at the end, again, it's 1633, he says, I, I've said all these things to you that you have peace. And all these things, there's a lot there. Love one another, all, you know, abide in me, all these things. But one of the most significant things he says in John 14 through 16 is, I am going to send you the helper the comforter, the spirit of truth, and he will be in you and he will be with you forever, right? The spirit of Christ, his very presence. How do we have peace, the peace of God, peace in life? It comes from the presence of God, which comes in his spirit. See, because Jesus is around, there's peace, you think. Remember that story with the disciples on the boat? Long day of ministry, Jesus preaches long sermon, everyone gets healed, Great day of ministry. They get in a boat. They cross the Sea of Galilee. Boom, big storm comes up. But Jesus is so tired, he's just sleeping. He's out. And the disciples are all like, you know, throwing water out, throwing water. Finally, they're like, will somebody wake up the Son of God? And so they're, and they're Jesus, wake up. And what do they say? Don't you care about us? Don't you care that we're, we're dying? Wake up. Don't you care? How often in our life? When things are sideways, what's our response to God? Don't you care that I lost my job? Don't you care about this cancer? Don't you care that I didn't get into the school I wanted? Don't you care that I'm struggling with depression and anxiety? Don't you care that I'm lonely? Don't you care that we don't have enough money? Isn't that, isn't that how it is? Don't you care? And what does Jesus do in, this, in that story? He wakes up, he says, hush, be still. Psh, everything settles. And he looks at the disciples. He says, where is your faith? I'm sitting right here. I mean, what are you so worried about? I'm right here. Did you not just see what I did earlier today? What are you, you guys are such spazzes. What are you so worried about? What is he saying? I'm here, ain't I? His presence should bring peace. Y'all should have been like, let's go barefoot and let's go water skiing. This is awesome. And we're not going to die because Jesus is right there. He ain't going to let me die. So let's just kind of take it to the limit, right? But no, they're all afraid. And, and we do the same thing. And I know how it is. I know how we think because I think this way. You're thinking, yeah, but if Jesus was really here, I mean like sitting right there, here, then I wouldn't be worried about money because I know if, if I need money, I can just go out and throw a fishing line in the water and just like Peter caught a fish and there was his taxes, I can get my taxes paid for TurboTax in the fishing pond if Jesus is there. Or I, I, if I'm, I don't need to worry about getting sick because as soon as I get a cold, I don't need a prescription, I just go to Jesus. 
Or I, I don't, I, if I got relationship issues with me and my spouse, I can just call on Jesus and he can tell her how she's wrong. <laughs> so, so if Jesus was really here, I wouldn't really be stressed and worried. And what Jesus would respond to that would be, but am I not here? Didn't I say it's better for me to go away? Because if I go away, then I will send the helper and he will be with you always. Jesus' response would be, I am here. I'm here. Always. End of the age. My presence is, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, I know this is, it's hard to grasp, but you, he is always with you. Oh, you're never alone. Never. What can separate you from the love of God in Christ? Anything? Romans 8? No. If God is for you, if God is for you, who can be against you? Right? He who did not spare his own son, how will he not give you all things? If his sheep hear his voice and they follow him and, and he, no one is able to snatch him out of his hand and the father who is greater than him, no one is able to snatch him out of, out of his hand. His presence brings peace. It's the peace of God. And I, here's, here's where that, that may sound to some of you very like, yeah, yeah, I know that. This is, where this is hard is not when peace like a river attendeth my way. Where this is hard is when sorrows like sea billows roll. And some of y'all rolling right now. And, and I, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where we need the peace of God. When there is huge loss that some of you have, left, some of you have gone through. When there has been, there's right now sickness brokenness in relationships and body that's when the, that's when the rubber meets the road and and you say oh, how do I have it in that moment you keep coming back to what Paul and Jesus and Peter these guys call precious and magnificent promises it's reminding being reminded of the the, the very love and peace and joy that the father has with the son he's offering to us and you're like I, I it's hard for me to believe then tell him help my belief help me believe that's, that's a very biblical prayer. You got to come back to the truth. Have you ever been on a plane with someone who's scared of flying? It's fun. It really is. I used to, when I was younger, I used to hate turbulence. Now I like it. Because I like to look at people freak out, and it's funny to me. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a little bit sadistic, but because it's just funny to see people spaz in a plane as if... You can do anything about it. You're at 38,000 feet. If something happens to the plane, next thing you know, you're going to see Jesus. You're going to pass out, and you're going to see Jesus. That's what's going to happen. I mean, you may wake up at like 20 feet above the ground like, ah, and then you won't remember that anyway either. So, but see, what, what you have to know, and, and, and I'm not a pilot, and I don't claim to be. I mean, I can play one on, on the video game, and I'm pretty good, but turbulence is really not going to do anything. In fact, the last time a commercial jet was brought down by turbulence was 1966, and I read about that. It was the pilot's fault because he decided to leave the flight plan and go fly next, close to the mountain so that everyone could get a good view, and they did because the tail got ripped off. Uh, and that was the last time turbulence brought down a plane. Okay, so turbulence in itself is not that bad. And the, the airplanes that are designed now, that you know, if you've ever seen the videos of how they bend the wings, like almost like that, it's crazy. I mean, so when you're looking out the window and, the, and the things like this, you're like, oh, no, the wings are going to fall off. They're not going to fall off. They're just waving. They're just waving. But see, when you know those things, it makes it fun to watch people spaz and grab the thing like they can do something. Because it's not gonna, nothing's going to happen to the plane. It's like, this is why you go on roller coasters, right? Because you get close to this, the edge. And now some of you ride the roller coaster the way God intended, like this. Some of you are grabbing on with all you can as if that's going to change anything. There's many insurance agents that are making sure that nothing is going to happen to you. But it feels like I'm in control. Right? The thing is this. You're completely secure because the things are on you. Now, it's going to be wild. But when you understand that you are safe, even in the wild, it can bring you peace. And, and Jesus is much more secure than any plane 
a roller coaster. And if God allows this in your life, you can come back to the precious and magnificent promise that, that he is at work in you for your good and his glory, even if that means he's pruning you, which is hard. Even if that means that there's a struggle, which no one wants that. That's why he tells us so much about take courage, I have overcome. Let me give you a verse. This is a great one that if, if, to memorize, to kind of to hide in our heart. Um, he says this in Isaiah, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. The idea there is you, you, gotta, you gotta have your mind constantly reminded of these things, which is why it's important for us to gather, for you to sing. I know some of you are like, I don't like to sing. You're not just singing to God. You are reminding the people in this room, it is well with my soul even if I don't feel like it. And we need to hear that. Kirby needs to hear it as well with his soul today, right? We need to be reminded of those things. This is why community, y'all, is so important. Community groups, so important. Because you, the tendency when we struggle, when there's depression, what do we do? We pull away, we hide. That's the last thing we need. What we need is to, to lean in, to be reminded. And so your mind is stayed on him because you trust in him. And, you, and the result is perfect peace. It's, it's hard, but, but you've got to lean in there, right? Um, God has promised his peace, peace in life, peace not from stuff, but in stuff. And it's rooted in the fact that we now have peace with God that we are no longer enemies, that we are his children. So peace with God, peace in life. And here's the last one, and this is the hard one. For some of y'all, it's gonna be really hard, right? It's peace with others. Peace with others. Here's what the writer to Hebrews says. Strive for peace with everybody. Well, that's, do you need me to explain that really? I mean, isn't that, is that clear enough? <laughs> strive for me. The word for strive there, it actually means to run. I know some of you don't run. You got to run at this one. Run towards peace with who? Everybody. Even them, especially them. Because it's easy to have peace with these people I hear you love. All the LSU fans today love each other. By the way, Clint's not an LSU fan. He lost a bet. That's why he's wearing the jersey. <laughs> Just guard, I'm protecting my buddy's reputation, right? Okay. He didn't switch. He's not a fair weather fan. Strive for peace with everyone. You, remember that enemy conversation we had earlier? The guy who put you out of business? The person that had the affair? That person that went behind your back? Yeah, them. Peace. That's hard. Run towards it. And I know, I know that you can say, well, you don't know what they've done. You don't know how hard it is and you don't know how mean they are. I hear you. Trust me, I do. But here's the thing. One day you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You will stand before the Prince of Peace. Do you think your excuse is going to hold up there? Well, they were mean, Jesus. Mean. You know, you saw it all. And he'll say, I did see it all. But you put me on a cross. And I forgave you. Now, he may not say that, but that's what the truth of the matter is. And that's the point. That's why we strive. Right under the uh, Romans, Paul says that we are to, as much as it depends on us, at the end there, live peaceably. That means sometimes it won't, it won't be possible because the other person will not do it. But you're, it's your job to move as much as you can. You've made the phone call. You've written the letter. You've pursued as best you can, and, and, and you've left it up to God. Right? Because and this matters. This is why... Jesus talks about if you're about to you're gonna lay your offering down on the altar and then you remembered, oh man, I cut that guy off and I was mean, I gotta, I gotta go apologize. And you gotta go and fix that before you worship because this matters like this matters. The vertical and the horizontal are related. You can't be all, well, I have a great relationship with God. I do a three-hour quiet time. I pray all day long and you're a jerk to your employees and you have horrible relationship with your kids and don't bring me the quiet time peace. Go reconcile over there. Go make peace. 
as much as it's up to you. Sometimes it, ha it doesn't work, but at least you've gone. And if there's going to be peace, here's the reality. Some of y'all are going to have to forgive some people. You're just going to have to. You're going to have to release it. You're going to have to let it go. It's destroying you from the inside out anyway, isn't it? You're going to have to have some humility and, and forgive because you've been forgiven. Here's what James says about it. The brother of Jesus. Where jealousy and amb selfish ambition exists, there is disorder in every vile practice. But wisdom from above, you say, I'm, I'm wise, I'm smart. Wisdom from above is, is first pure and then it's peaceable. If you're wise, there's some peace. Peter says this, you want, you want good days? Whoever desires to love life. You want to love life? You want to have good days? Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn from evil and do good. Let him seek peace. Right? That's, that's the good life. Proverbs says it's the good life. Deceit is in the heart of the, those who devise evil, but those who play in peace have joy. I, I can continue to go. I don't think I need to. The point is this. Jesus himself says, blessed are the what? Peacemakers. And then the second part I think is significant. They shall be called sons of God. Sons of God and daughters of God. Why? Because you are like the ultimate peacemaker, the prince of peace. He's the one who made peace with you. And so you are representing your dad. Blessed, happy, satisfied are the peacemakers. This all starts with Emmanuel. God with us. God with us brings peace with God. He brings peace of God in life. And then he says, now it's time for you to go make peace with others. Right? And then one day, maybe today, maybe in a thousand years, the Prince of Peace will come back. This is what Advent's about, right? We look back at Bethlehem. All the prophecies concerning his first Advent, they all took place. Born of a virgin, born of Bethlehem, from Nazareth, running to Egypt, all those things from the tribe of Judah, from the David's throne, you know, David's lineage, all those things. So if all the first ones took place, that means all the second ones will too. And what we do at Advent is we look forward to that. And one day, there's a, there's a verse in Isaiah, very famous verse. If you've ever been to New York City to the UN, the plaza across the, the street there has this verse out there. It says this, he shall judge between the nations, shall decide, despite, ugh, decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Can I just tell you, the UN will never be able to do that. Because it's not an organization. Notice it says, he shall judge. He is Messiah. When the Prince of Peace comes, he will have peace. True peace. But he's the only one that can bring it. He made peace, the blood of his cross, peace with God. He gives us the peace of God in life, and he says, now you go be my peacemakers. That's how God with us brings peace. And we're going to worship and sing. Again, if you need someone to just talk to or pray with, there's some folks, again, in the, in the hallways after the service in the back, they'd love to pray with you. You have questions about something, they, they could point you in the right direction. That's why we're here. And I know, look, I know for some of you, peace like a river is a tenon your wayeth. And I know others of you, sorrows like sea billows are rolling. And so we want to be there for you and, and encourage you and just be with you to point you back that your mind would be stayed on him because he trusts in him. We want to point you back to that perfect peace. So if we can do that, let us know. But let me pray. Why don't you go stand and we'll worship.